I'm in London. It's cold. I'm on a constant search for coffee, but I need to pull my brain together and figure out what classes I'll be taking since I'm starting my master's at Columbia University in exactly one month. I am back, going to stare at the syllabus, figure out what to study. Now, it must be said, I haven't chosen classes in like over three years. And I remember that when I was in college and I had to choose classes, it was extremely overwhelming because it was just like you want to take everything and anything. It always feels like there's not enough time in the world to study what you want to. So I'm quite daunted by this prospect. Also, given the fact that we are expected to write a dissertation in our second year. So it's not like we have as much leeway as we did in college where you can kind of just like bounce around. You have four years. You can figure out what you want to do. No, no, no two years chop chop. <laughs> so I have to be pretty picky with what I choose now. And it also has to hopefully tie with the dissertation that I'll be doing in the second year. Do I know that exact topic? No, but that's fine. Okay. So the two core courses that I have to take, and I have no choice but to enroll within my dual master's that is based out of Columbia University and a London School of Economics, International History. The first one is Approaches to International and Global History. It is what it probably sounds like, where you learn the methodologies of the global history, how you create and think about cross-national analysis in your research. Pretty straightforward, one semester. Then the second mandatory one is the Research Skills and Methods in International and World History. This one's a little bit different because this is specifically focusing on the research skills and methods that you will be using as an international historian and how to also create a research project and potential oral sources if you're using if you're using individuals who are alive rather than, for example, archives and sourcing it from the archives. So this class is also meant us to help develop our dissertation ideas going forward, which will be great because I definitely need to shape that idea up a little bit. Now, I also actually have to take a language requirement. I have to pass two languages and I will be taking one exam in Russian as I speak Russian. Um, I also speak French, very <laughs> beginner level. I don't think I can pass that exam. So I think I may have to enroll in a year long course in order to meet the program requirements for that. In terms of the electives, this is where things get a little bit tricky. I definitely want to take one writing course, hopefully, that is based within the Columbia's MFA program. I hope I can get into that class. I may be jinxing it, <laughs> but that is my goal of what I would like to be taking in the fall. And the other electives that I would hopefully take would be closer to my dissertation. And I'm specifically interested in the intellectual and cultural history within the 20th century and looking at specifically how like various political bodies across nations have impacted cultural institutions and the cultural products such as literature that is created and the interplay between the two. I'm also interested in exploring that through the lens of feminist thought and feminist critical theory. What that will mean, who knows? <laughs> so far, there is one course that I'm interested in and that's called American Radicalism, taught by a cultural historian. And that's why I'm specifically interested in that. Maybe that's what I'll enroll in. There isn't a specific history class that is tied to the types of feminist thought that I'm interested in exploring potentially from a cultural perspective. So I think I may have to weave that in on my own. There was a class that I just found that looked really fascinating and it was on Susan Sontag, Hannah Arendt, and Mary McCarthy, some of the most stunning intellects of the time period. I'm extremely interested in all of their work and the cultural work that they've produced within both theory and the arts, but I believe is an undergraduate course, so I can't take it. It won't be counted, which is so sad. I wish I could go back to my undergrad years and enroll in this course. And that's kind of it for now. We only, I think, are actually supposed to take four classes per semester, which just sounds so little. I would like to take far more classes than that, but I know that the school year is quite packed. Four classes always doesn't sound like a lot. And then we have to do all the reading for those classes. You're like, never mind. This is a lot. Especially I can imagine the graduate school classes will have maybe triple times more reading than I'm used to. And I'm going to have to get my brain activated in that mode. I think I might also read some of my old essays from my undergraduate years just because I do not remember how to write an academic essay. I've been writing academic reviews 
um, book reviews and I've like still been publishing in a more serious manner if you want to call that but that's a little different than an academic essay so I think I just need to remind my brain what that feels like in terms of a practice skill set. Let me know if you experienced this too when you were going back to school and going back to a master's, especially if you took some time in between college and going back to master's. Was How was that tra transition? Did you kind of have to ease back into the, the academic style of like homework deadlines, essays, all of those things, or was it pretty easy? I'm hoping that I just snap back into it, but I don't know. I might not snap. <laughs> might not snap anywhere. I might just snap and break. I will be positive and I will try not to snap. Also, it must be noted that we were given a optional summer, suggested summer reading list. <sighs> when I first got into the program and I saw this, I was extremely excited and ambitious and I was like, I will read this. Have I read anything from here? No, no, I have not. That's fine. I have two years to read all of the work that I want to. So I'm putting no pressure. Actually, this summer, I haven't been reading as much as normal. I've just been so busy socially and doing things and figuring everything out before school starts and just living. I've been trying to take my driver's license test, but I haven't read as much, which doesn't make me happy. It's not a happy thing. But I would like to talk about the books that I recently bought because I'm hoping that they will be amazing. And they'll get me out of this reading slump and that I can read all of August, all of my summer books, hopefully get back into it. And then once I start school, I'll be reading the school books and also hopefully dabbling that with some personal pleasure reading. I don't know. As you can tell, I'm being extremely ambitious. Will half of these happen? Things happen? Who knows? Who knows? So this is my little book haul. The books. The one I'm currently reading is Accidents in the Home by Tessa Hadley. I have read Tessa Hadley's novels before. Some of them I've loved. Some of them haven't resonated with me as much. I really liked, I'm blanking on the name, but I'm going to put the photo of what the book was that I really liked. She's an extremely crafty writer. She, she just talks about interpersonal relationships, specifically within the family and romantic relationships. And on the surface, it might seem kind of boring, but as soon as you start it, you just get really delved into the story and the character's intricacies their inner worlds. She reminds me kind of of Carol Shields, Alice Munro, all stunning writers. So that's what I'm currently, so that's my current read. Then I bought Lessons in Chemistry. Listen, I caved. I know this is like a pop fiction or it's been circulating around all of the bookstores. And first of all, I really like this British cover 10 times better than the US one, which is this, which is hideous. And it's like made to look like a Walmart novel, which I'm sorry. This sounds very judgmental. <laughs> I am not hating on all of the women's fiction and chiclet. That's a whole other discussion of how that is marketed and how it's made to look trashy when it shouldn't be trashy. That could be potentially a separate video essay in and of itself. But I caved. I've heard amazing things about this from multiple people who read it and really liked it and said, ignore the hype and being scared about not reading it and just read it. So maybe that'll be my beach read. Then I bought Not to Read by Alejandro Zambra. I read his, I've read two actually novels from him this past year. The first one was Chilean Poet. Loved. One of my favorite books of the whole year. Prose is impeccable. The story was amazing. It was kind of a family drama. It was also about step parents. It was also about romantic love and like long-term relationships. It was about being an artist. What, it does it, what does it mean to be an artist who kind of failed at his craft or gave up on it later on in life? I haven't come across a novel like that in a while and I'm so happy I read it. This is just kind of a self-portrait literary autobiography as he describes it. And if it's half as good as Chilean Poet, I will be happy. I ha bought A Sport and a Pastime by James Salter. He's supposed to be one of the most iconic American writers of the 20th century. His novels are quite well known. I've never read any of his prose yet, but I am interested in it from a craft perspective to study more of his writing style. Lastly, I picked this up in one of the London, at the London Review Bookstore that I visited yesterday, was Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter by Mario Vargas Losa. I believe I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not. I've never seen this author, but apparently he won the Nobel Prize in Literature a few years ago. 
And it kind of actually reminded me a little bit of the Chilean poet in terms of the storyline. And I'm hoping it's an amazing novel because I like quickly looked up reviews, which sometimes I hate doing, like looking up Goodreads reviews in the bookstore, but we all have our faults. And everyone said they really liked this novel. So I'm hoping it's as promising as it was meant out to be. Now I'm going to go and actually read these books. Look at what you did. I'm happy to report that I finished a book for once. It was Accidents in the Home by Tessa Hadley. It was a very classic Hadley novel. It was a quiet domestic novel about various family relationships. I wasn't my favorite just because of the fact that it was one of those novels that starts off with like a family branch page at the start, which is when you know you're in for a ride and you have to keep track of many characters. And it was actually kind of hard to keep track of the divorces and who got back together with who, who had children with who, why they were divorced. Not my favorite when you have to like flip back and forth, back and forth, remembering who is who, but she had stunning passages as usual. And now I'm going to go on to a quicker, faster summer read. But most importantly, I'm actually going to go to a cafe that is located in a church in the middle of London, which I've never heard of or seen. And there was a person that just walked by. That cafe was amazing, really looked like a museum, not like there should have been a coffee being served. And now I decided to actually go back to the London School of Economics, which I will be at in my second year. My master's was a dual master's first year with Columbia University, second year with the London School of Economics. And it's been so nice to see the campus. It definitely looks way more different than it did before. I was here a few years ago as I did my study abroad here, and the campus actually looked quite different. There was a lot of construction going on, but as you can see from this footage, it is stunning and pristine, and I'm very excited to be based out of here in exactly one year. There have been a few developments since I last chatted to you. Number one, the one elective that I really, really wanted, American Radicalism, I heard back from the professor but he is not offering it in the fall, even though it is on their class registrar. So my planned syllabus is kind of down the drain and I have to find a new elective. And I'm really hoping that I can secure the other nonfiction writing elective that I did choose and that that one is also not canceled. I don't know why, but when I first read the email from the professor, I was reminded from the Devil Wears Prada quote or Meryl Streep is like, details of your incompetence do not interest me. Not that the professor, that's what the professor said, <laughs> but for some reason, the tone reminded me of that quote. So moving on, I'm here now to find a new elective. The second development is it's still raining in London, still grim, even though it's August and it's supposed to be like the balmy summertime. I bought more books. Shocking, shocking. This time it was at Foils, which is around Charing Cross, Oxford Street. I hate that area. I really don't like to go in that area. It gives me flashbacks to like Times Square in New York. Actually, it's better than Times Square in New York. Still both atrocious, I would say. Too touristy, too many shops. Very questionable. But the two books that I got is Claudia Pinheiro's A Little Luck. And this one's signed. Boom. Signed by the author, which I think is kind of a neat little addition. Last year? Was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. I read her book called Eleanor Knows, which I really loved. One of my most favorite books from last year. And I actually don't even know what this one is that much about. And I don't want to know. Everyone who has read Eleanor Knows and then read A Little Luck said that they loved this one as well. I'm just going to dive in, see how I like it with no really preconceived notions of what the novel will have. Why I Grow Up by Susan Neiman. Subtitle is Subversive Thoughts for an Infantile Age. It says that she draws on thinkers such as Kant, Rousseau, and Arendt, and she shows that genuine adulthood, not permanent youth, is a subversive ideal worth striving for. Honestly, that bur blurb really piqued my curiosity, and I'm always really interested in reading both philosophical and social theorists' kind of musings on life, how we also conceive the idea of like a linear narrative of our life stories, how that's been created, why certain social ideas such as like adulthood, for example, are kind of a sham. All is to say this really piqued my interest and I'm hoping it holds up to the expectations that I currently have for this book. And I have been reading Lessons in Chemistry. I probably won't finish it by the time this vlog is done, 
but I'm actually really liking it so far, far more than I thought, because it's set in the 1960s with a chemist who is kind of breaking around in the field. She's really trying to like make a name for herself within the field. She was at one point striving her PhD, but then an incident occurred that stopped her from being able to proceed further in academia where she was discriminated in a very egregious manner. I definitely hesitated to pick this one up just because I was, I thought it was going to be very simple, bland, like 1960s feminism, career woman, who can? Like the women weren't just wives back, then, or like the women were only wives, but they could do more. And this is them very whitewashed middle class feminist novel or at least the quick blurb tells you that but I think there's actually more to the story and more grip to the story and so that's what I'm excited to explore as I keep reading this one now on to the real meat <laughs> of this video which I ambitiously titled this as creating my syllabus Will this syllabus actually be officially created? No, that's only going to be created in September. But I like to be ambitious, what can I say? I'm officially back in the student portal. Apparently there are two portals. Let's hope that whatever I choose this time is actually going to be taught in the fall and there are spots for me to fill. There's one class called Truth from the Past, Introduction to the Philosophy of History, which is exploring philosophies of history from the ancient Greeks to the present. This is not directly tied to what I would want my dissertation to be, but I am really interested in the topic. But since it's not fully tied to my dissertation, I don't think I can do it or should do it. I think I need to be a bit more picky. Okay, I've been scrolling quite heavily and I can't come across a specific class that I really want. And I just genuinely think their syllabus portal is extremely chunky and I'm kind of confused now at what is actually available or not available considering the fact that I thought this class was available, turns out it isn't. And in about a week or so, I'm actually going to have an advising call with a person from our program. And hopefully with her, with her help, I'll be able to pin down my last class elective that I will be enrolling in in the fall semester. Otherwise, my other three classes are hopefully kind of solidified-ish. The first two are the ones that are mandatory. The third one hopefully will be a nonfiction writing one. And then the fourth one will be an elective in history. That's kind of my current plan. I guess in a few weeks, I'll check back in with you and actually let you know what I did end up deciding to enroll in. Maybe I was fully off and fully wrong with what I predicted just now. But the other thing is I wanted to also just chat in general about my thoughts about starting graduate school, how I'm feeling, starting in less than a month. I mean, I haven't been back in school in like three years, so it feels like quite a lot of time has passed, but also like no time has passed. I don't know if you ever get that type of sense. Also because I was so used to living the structure of the school life in terms of like thinking of September, start of the year, you would get your act together. I think like even when I was working and all of my jobs were actually remote jobs, I kind of think my brain functioned in that capacity like I remember still working in the summer <laughs> through a whole summer but then in September thinking like oh like gotta get back to like full work and like full intensity and being more dedicated in the in September when I once I returned once I kept doing my job which I think is an interesting way to construct your time but also since I've only really lived within the rubric of school up until a certain point for however many years it has been it makes sense that we are conditioned to think of it of our lives structured around this and i'm excited to have my life structured around this again even if it's just for two years we'll see how it goes i'm currently trying not to put too much pressure on myself in terms of what i'm hoping to achieve in the program i have a few goals for myself of what i want to do I definitely think I want to try and get one of my academic papers published if possible, whether that be for an academic journal or whether that be for more of just like a mainstream public online publication. Don't know exactly. It'll depend kind of on what my, on what I end up researching and writing and studying and if whether I can mold that kind of for a wider audience or not, or whether it's just going to have to remain strictly academic. I also just want to see whether I want to further pursue academia. I do think it's quite limiting and it's also quite a lot of effort <laughs> to fully properly pursue a PhD doctorate. Right now I'm leaning more on towards the side of no, but maybe actually my mind will change once I'm in the master's 
and back in the brain space that I haven't occupied in quite a while. I also was kind of saking myself out because I was like, I need to accrue more internships or work experiences more within the field that I'm interested in within like media and everything like that. But I think for now, I'm going to try and focus just on my studies in this next year and kind of give it my all because I'm not really going to have another time in my life to be able to do that. I think I just need to soak that in and not have my brain be all over the place and try to get work and study and do this and that. I'm also just hoping to expand my own portfolio of work, hence picking up my YouTube channel again, doing more of my own writing, and kind of putting my energies into more of my own things that I've piloted. Piloted, wow, that sounds way more fancier than and it is. So those are just my general rambles of going back to graduate school. Let me know how you felt when you went back to graduate school and also how you found the transition and what you found most helpful in kind of getting back into that schedule of thinking about classes and deadlines. And it's definitely just a different space than working. I mean, like I'm no longer going to be on a nine to five where after 5 p.m. I can just clock off go make dinner for myself, see my friends, not have to worry about finishing up anything if I didn't have to do anything further for that work day. And it'll be interesting to see how I return to more flexible schedule <laughs> where it's all up to me to get it done on whatever hours I want to. Hopefully I don't stress myself out too much, but I guess we'll see. I hope you enjoyed seeing all the new bits of London, hearing a bit more about my studies as I embark on this new journey very soon. And I'm excited to share more with you as I start at Columbia and kind of let you in on what it, it feels like to be back in graduate school at Columbia University, what the classes are like, what I'm getting from them. So I'm just very excited to share it all. If you haven't already, you can hit the subscribe button down below and I'll see you next time. Bye.